All right, with no further ado, I'm going to welcome our next reader, and uh, that is Charles Castle. Charles has been writing since the sixth grade. He started reading his poetry publicly at 19 in the North Wind Coffee House in Saranac Lake, New York. Uh, the same year, he hitchhiked across Alaska from Maine and fought fire in the per permafrost forest out of Fort Nelson in the Yukon. He moved to Eugene in 1978, where he worked 27 years in health care. And in 2005, he visited El Salvador with the Catholic Health Association. More recently, he served four years as an AmeriCorps construction supervisor for Habitat for Humanity. He is 63 years old with three children and three grandchildren and says life is good and there is no place like Eugene. Um, also, just for fun, I asked my poets to do like either a short bio or a two-sentence bio of something fun. Well, let's, this is what Charles came up with. Charles has been a resident of Eugene for over 35 years, but is originally from New England. He has written since he was a kid, yet considers himself new to writing poetry. His muse is storytelling and something else, not necessarily in that order. So please welcome Charles Castle. I think I have two different kinds of poems. I have story poems and then something else. So this is a something else. Poem as a subatomic particle. This poem has no half-life. It will be gone before all but the inner ear can hear it. This poem is not a single thing, but fragments of no things. It can only exist synapse to synapse and then return where it never was let us all run into each other and break apart that we may come together forever and never somewhere between them let us discover there is no mere god Is there anybody here who isn't familiar with Kush Cafe? All right. So this may be for you, for you if you're interested in poetry. A call to kindred spirits. Empty out the bottle of psychotropic vitamins. And in one swallow, pour them into the mouth of the disposal. The doctor behind the therapeutic computer will not be happy, but when it's time, it's time. A smart man told me, Freud, and I paraphrase, said, every man is a little neurotic. The crazy, creative ones simply have their personalities cranked up a notch or two higher and are therefore considered other. Are you tired of hiding it these days? Come seek out your kindred spirits and sit all cush and comfy and listen to their voices. Me, I wait in the early evening, studying the sacred geometry of a broken rack of balls, reading them like tea leaves on the table, taking their predictions to heart. Then I sit with my brothers and sisters to hear hungry, full-maned lions and sleek jaguars just then released from their flimsy cages. Exotic and the erotic flaming birds hovering motionless above the stage in their ultraviolet glow. Borderland prophets under their cannabis halos Hermetic shepherds who have captured lightning in their eyes and who know how to wield it in spontaneous time. The luminary gray hairs, the healers, 
the hearts that swell before you envelop you and make your own heart weep such sweet tears. And oh, the holy witches and wizards of Whitaker, who chant spells that stop the evening southern Pacific in its tracks. Every voice is welcome, sought after, cheered. Can I get an F yeah? F yeah! <laughs> Be sure to wait for the ultimate and the pan ultimate and hold your chair to the ground for the final apocalypse. I can say you will survive, most likely with your psyche tight against the ceiling, all notches cranked. But no doubt you will be better for it, as so this world. Haiku Trinity, the other eye, appearing ideas, unenvisioned, blinding the radiance of words. Poem does not hear the lark. It longs to sing and fly with its own wings. I thirst for the ink, water bucket at the door parched in the hot sun. <clears throat> All right, if you choose to, close your eyes and let's play the what if game. The first one's just for fun. What if? What if God was just a construction foreman or maintenance man for this universe? And the multitude of universes all have their own gods. Would they unionize? What if you could hold one thought in your mind through each waking day? Could you see yourself on a speck in space? How far out would be your point of view? What if you saw every face on the street as your own, and in that variety recognized every phase of your life, how would it change your sense of self? What if you could live forever, starting right here, right now? Would you get that medical degree, dance, learn to write in runes? What if every ancestor in your family walked with you in all your days and nights? What stories would they tell you? Would you know if, they, if you began to channel them? What if everything was perfect in its becoming? What if? So most all of these are, are fairly recent, and this one in particular is recent, and it's called, it's called Storming the Citadel of Heaven. Red-robed cardinals in the Vatican were searching for a match for the fire to release the white smoke over Rome so they didn't see it. During the July parade after the war, the lead majorette dropped her baton in the street. The Knights of Columbus marching behind her and the town fathers watched when she picked it up and did not feel it pass through the crowd. In Pat Robinson was asleep on the set when it, when it left the interview chair in silence. Dick Cheney was signing a wedding card to his daughter, as if he would know. But on Pennsylvania Avenue, the traffic halted briefly, even the cabs. Pope Francis was, bless, was busy blessing babies when it tapped him on the shoulder 
but he didn't look up. Only an old homeless woman in a manic state saw it and waved from her view in the alley. So has it been since the word was first spoken, but then somehow redacted from the final text. That other prophecy, the one never his to fulfill, it was always only ours to bring into life the second coming. Even now you might feel around you the stirring of scented air, hear a sudden hush among the stirb, disturbed voices, or see an altercation on the street transformed before your eyes unto the embrace of a long lost brothers, or a sprinter in a race who stops mid stride and stares up at the crowd. How would we ever know? How simple it might be. All this time, all the unanswered prayers, the unthanked offerings, the solemn obedience, waiting, waiting. That most divine and devout of joys, even in suffering, to see resurrected around you every soul saved and yours in virtue to serve until the end of days. The word I cannot find. Serendipity, the gift of finding something not sought after. Synchronicity, coincidental movement or existence, the occurrence of acts, events, or developments in time. I am looking for that next word. I would know its definition if I heard it, but I cannot express it to you. I used to live in the Adirondacks when I was um, in my early 20s, and uh, it's a very special, a very special place up around Lake Placid and Saranac Lake. Lots of lakes, lots of chains of lakes. Ice. In the Adirondack Januaries, we would walk the frozen lakes at night, swept by the winds of the days. The vast expanse was clean and clear of obstacles and would stretch for miles up the Saranac chain. During a full moon, the experience was spectacular, like being on a fully lit stage with a countless audience of stars. When there was no moon, especially when the blizzard raged, it was another place entirely. A half mile or more from shore, you walked in a white-out bubble, devoid and detached. Here you could not help but think you had become lost in a place between worlds and would never find your way home. But what was perhaps most profound under either sky was the ice itself. For in a 20 below midnight, it would labor to release the heat of a 10 degree day and so doing would rumble loudly in the distance or closer would cry in a deep crystalline scream both would send shock waves shock waves up your legs and drive a stake into your gut the sounds never stopped they just played out around you like storms on all horizons. Sometimes, if you looked for it, you might see the lightning-like chasm, the approaching dividing line where it cracked apart, apart an inch wide. If this passed between your feet, it made an impression. One night, on the return loop, I walked too close to shore where under a gathered drift, a small spring was hidden. Breaking through, I went down, one leg to the hip. 
I got up, but no, but now I know, it was a fast pace and a young man's circulation got me back alive. The lesson I may have learned and carried with me since is it may be safer to stay out away from things, even if it seems you are between worlds. Yet I will always remember the multi-layered frozen leg and the rigid limp home. This is, this is one, if I can find it, for somebody I care a lot about. Don't spare the rod. All those years from New England streams to the log pond feeders here, a toddler below a railroad bridge, bass, sunfish, trout, all except for the first cutthroat, that taken proudly home to mom, were sent off gently with an open palm. Even later, so too the 20 pounders hidden in the high lakes. The times on the rogue in July, when the summer steelhead, 30 or 40 a day, would still weigh in like some of the winters. On Crane Prairie, before it saw its first bass, chrome and crystal rainbows were hostage to the live nymph, where no doubt they still may be. And all the waters and days up to now, when he fished, he would fish with me. In those years he grew, and the wonder of glowing screens, games, and role play, enticing as they must do, he did not, of his own, ever take the rod and go until today. He has a birthday soon and his own house. So I declare and give fair warning to all fish of river south, hold deep in rock and niche, or you will know the power of his tender hand. Here I will wait to hear the tale, my son, on new waters out where life belongs, my goal found and satisfied. South China, Maine, hidden fields, forgotten in tangled woods, long piles of stones, a wall of lost days, misplaced memories, the faint smell of smoke, a crumbled hearth, moss-covered brick, weak mortar returned to sand, orchards grown desperate and wild haven for deer and midnights forlorn. <laughs> Growing up in Connecticut. Growing up in Connecticut, it never felt like home unless I was walking in the hardwood or hunting brook trout along a stream. In my junior year, I joined the fire department and in the small hours of the night would run the quarter mile to the station when the siren called. A skinny kid, quietly known for the town's first acid bust, they put me on top of the tanker to watch the water level. I think now they could have done that from the ground. At 40, I returned to help my parents paint their house. In the small hours, unable to sleep, I walked past the dark station in the cool, still night. The blue and red flashing lights and the whoop of the police siren brought me back to another time. You cannot walk the country roads after dark in that town. Those streets were always empty, even in the day. 
Recently, I read that Dylan was picked up one evening in a coastal New Jersey neighborhood for strolling and with no ID. Today, I run after my own sirens when some fire in my head wakes me. If a cop does pass, he usually waves. I am home, and I love Eugene. Time? Okay. I can go more, I can go less. Oh, I can lots, I can lots. Thank you so much, Charles. Brilliant. Great poetry. So welcome to the poetry stage. Um, we're, we're here all weekend with uh, many diverse kinds of readings and performances. Uh, we got all kinds of poets, young and old, uh, performance poets, literary poets, young poets. Tomorrow we're having a youth event 